Hi, everybody. Just a second. All right, let's do this. I'm in lockdown right now. Uh, one of my neighbors tested positive, so I'm two weeks down, no symptoms. Everything seems to be just fine. No issues as of now, but I'm not exactly leaving the house, so I'm not going on rides. I've got the trainer set up, and uh, I don't, well, I have a little bit of content for videos, but I'm gonna do a bike check because it's something I can easily do from the garage, and I don't think it's anything I've ever done, at least not since I added all the parts to the, uh, to the Ritmo V2. So let's go. All right, everybody. This is the Ritmo V2. You've seen it before. It's been in a bunch of videos. It's nothing new, but uh, it's my favorite bike. It rides great. It's a wonderful bike. It's a 29 inch wheel. It's got a fairly long wheelbase and uh, it's got, uh, I think a fairly slack head tube angle. So it cruises over the hills real easy and it rides real nice and smooth. It's a pleasure. It climbs like a mountain goat because the seat tube is steep enough that you're kind of sitting up, kind of up top and uh, it makes it easier to get over some of the bumps and it's not that heavy. So it's a really, really well-designed bike. And in my opinion, it's pretty much the best bike you can get today, at least frame wise. You know, you can make it up any way you want to. Back when the bike was new, I bought it with a uh, entry level group set and I got rid of just about everything and replaced it with some of my own parts, which is the build we're gonna talk about today. What did I keep? I kept the headset and I kept the forks and we'll talk about those, but those are pretty much the only things. I think I also replaced the bottom bracket. Yeah, so it's just the headset and the forks are the two things that I kept. And the wheels, it came with pretty nice wheels, but I'm actually rebuilding the wheels. So it's not even gonna have the wheels in another few weeks. And that'll be a fun video. All right, the Ritmo frame itself made by Ibis in Santa Cruz, California. Great frame. A uh, little backstory. Um, I was looking into the Santa Cruz High Tower and the Ibis Ritmo, and then I learned that the Ritmo V2 was coming out, and so I decided to hold off. And then COVID hit. When COVID hit, uh, I was not able to do my test ride of the High Tower and the Ritmo V2, which really sucked because I wanted to test ride them before I bought one. I mean, this is a pretty big investment and I wanted to do it right. So what was I gonna do? Well, I just put off the decision and kept riding my old Bronson, which is, by the way, a fantastic bike. And uh, I decided to wait because what was I gonna do? Go on a road trip? So, you know, I was just sitting at home anyway. I uh, had an opportunity to ride a Ritmo V2, a friend of a friend of mine who works at Santa, or who works at Ibis Bicycles, um, made one available to me for a day and I got to take it on a test ride and it was heaven. It was everything I ever could have dreamed it would have been. So uh, I, the very next day I decided to start looking on the internet and this was right about the peak of the crazy bike purchasing uh, frenzy that happened at the beginning of COVID. And so it, it was really, really hard to find one. I was calling shops all over the country and it turned out that uh, the only shop that had one was a place uh, up in San Francisco um, called the Sports Basement, who happens to be the largest Ibis dealer. And I think they still are as far as I know. And uh, they had one up in San Francisco. So I jumped up in the car, drove up to San Francisco and bought this. It was a little over $3,000. It was the entry level build. I was really just buying the frame. And uh, I started swapping out these parts. All right, this is a Fox 36 performance level shock. It's like I said before, the shock that came on the bike and you know what? It's great. It's not top of the line. It's not super tuned. It doesn't have the little valve parts on the back here that I don't even know what they're called, but it's a great performing shock. It's 160 millimeters of travel. Um, it's all I'm ever gonna need, you know? Uh, I, I put the appropriate amount of pressure into it. I haven't really tuned anything else. I could probably learn a lot more about the way that shocks work, but I don't really need to with this shock. It's kind of a fire and forget. And as long as uh, it doesn't start losing pressure or something, I'm not that worried about it. Now, Fox has a program that I still have to do some more research on that uh, where if I send it in for a refit, I might be able to actually upgrade instead. And uh, I might look into that, I might not, it depends. I don't know if I really need to. So I'll be exploring that at that time, but I'm still at least a few months away from getting this thing rebuilt. Uh, in the meantime, it performs beautifully. I couldn't be happier with it. 
The rear shock is the DVO Jade Coil. I love this thing. It has done me very, very well. It eats up the bumps. It's easy to flip it between what's essentially a lockout. I don't think it's a full lockout and great travel. It's, uh, I believe, got um, 147 millimeters of travel and it doesn't look that bad either. The wheels. Now, the wheels that are on it are uh, Ibis carbon S35 rims and Ibis hubs with Supreme uh, bladed spokes. And they're great wheels, I have no complaints. But uh, I'm gonna rebuild some wheels anyway because I like having two sets of wheels and I wanna build a dream set of wheels. I haven't ever done that. I've built a lot of wheels in my life, but uh, not any in the last 10 years. So I'm gonna make another video about that. But I'm gonna make them out of Supreme spokes, just like what's in on there right now, uh, CX Ray bladed spokes. And then the hubs are gonna be these DT Swiss. These are gorgeous. And I heard that they're quiet, but then when I got them, I realized they're not super quiet. The 240S is what they are. And uh, they're terrific. Um, I've heard wonderful things about them. I bought the kit for upgrading it to, I believe it's a 54 tooth ratchet. And uh, so I'm gonna be popping that in there. And I think they're gonna be a really nice, high quality, responsive set of wheels that's gonna last me for, you know, as long as I own the bike, if not a lot longer than that. I'm once again going to be using um, Ibis S35 carbon rims. And uh, these things are ridiculously strong. I mean, I know that most carbon rims are pretty nice. Uh, I haven't found any that perform as well as these Ibis rims. So I have no reason to try anything else. These have never let me down. This will be my third set of wheels with these rims. And they just don't break. They're incredibly rigid. Uh, they have offset eyelets, so they build really well for both a front and a rear wheel, and they're very strong, so no complaints at all. I think it's going to be a really nice set of wheels. The tires. All right, this bike shipped with the Maxxis Asagai tires, and I've put, I don't know, a thousand miles on them, and they're fantastic. The tread pattern's great. Um, People tell me they're a little on the heavy side. I haven't really noticed anything about the weight. You know, I'm not really a weight guy, as you can probably tell. But uh, I've been very, very happy with the tires. Um, while I was riding in uh, Colorado a few months ago, uh, somebody told me about the Aggressor. And so when I build up the new set of wheels, they're gonna have a brand new Asagai on the front and a brand new Aggressor on the rear and I'll be able to try these out. Um, I don't know how much difference I'm really gonna feel. You know, they're, they both look like they're really aggressive tread patterns. They both look very effective. They both have really nice outside edges, outside nubs that are going to hold me in turns. So in fact, they look almost identical in most respects. I know they're not the same. People pick that apart, but honestly, I think they're really not gonna feel that different. But I'll be posting the results and I'll let you know. These X01 SRAM carbon cranks have been very reliable. No complaints at all. They're 175 and a halfs, 175s, 175 and a halfs. I don't know. They're that long. And uh, they are as light as they need to be. They're incredibly rigid. And I beat the crap out of them on all, on all the rocks in North Carolina and Utah and Colorado and California and all the different places I've ridden this year. One thing that drives me crazy about them is the X01 logo. Every time I look at it, all I see is XG1. I think the O doesn't look like an O, and I just think it's kind of a an odd design. But really, that's not a reason to hate a crank. It, it's a great crank, and it works well, and it's a dub. The pedals, on the other hand, are brand new. I just bought some Shimano XTs, and uh, I bought them because that's what the bike shop had, and. They were pretty nice and they weren't outrageously expensive. I was replacing my uh, race face Chesters, which as you can tell, I've just beat the crap out of. I mean, there's almost nothing left on these things. It's just insane how much they've been ruined. But uh, I was really happy with the race face Chesters, but they did wear pretty hard pretty quickly. So I'm hoping that the XTs last a little bit longer. That being said, even if they don't, they were under a hundred bucks. So I'm not gonna be up at night worrying about it.
So far, so good. They really grip the shoes well. I'm a happy guy with these pedals. The headset is a Cane Creek 40 series headset. I don't know anything about this headset as opposed to another one, but I do know that Cane Creek makes great headsets. This is not the first Cane Creek I've owned and I've always liked them, but it works well. I don't know if there's nicer ones and how much nicer they are and why they're nicer, but this one's great, no complaints. I have a Industry 9 A35 stem that I just love. I really bought it because I just thought it was so pretty. I think it's the prettiest stem you can get, period. It's not the cheapest stem you can get, but oh damn, it's nice. So I was really happy to pick it up and throw it on the bike. The only downside is that I used to use a Garmin mount, which plugged right into the two holes on the headset. But these, uh, these bolts are too far apart. And so I can't mount this anymore. And that's why I had to buy this one. That being said, small price to pay. Oh my God, it's such a nice headset. I guess it's probably, an, it's Industry 9, so you know it's nice. It's probably very light and, you know, does everything else about as well as it can be done. But at the end of the day, it's just a, an aluminum headset and it's very pretty. The Race Face Next R 35 degree handlebar. It's a nice bar for sure. Um, I think it's a 35 millimeter rise and it's a 35 millimeter diameter clamp. So I had to line everything up to match that way. Supposedly the 35s are a little bit more rigid. I haven't really noticed a difference having come from, I think the other size is a 31.5. Uh, so, you know, it's been a great bar, but I don't know if it's necessarily better or worse than the other ones that are out there, but I've been real happy with it. Three cheers for Ori. My goodness, these things are great. This is my third set of these in seven years. Uh, they're, they're fantastic grips. They're grippy, they're soft. They have just the right amount of cushion that they're rigid enough and the rubber is soft enough that it grips your hand really, really well with and without gloves. And they clamp onto the bar really well with these uh, little metal sleeves. You can see that I've, I've banged them up a little bit, but you know, it's a small price to pay for a decent pair of grips. And they're not outrageously expensive. So uh, I, I definitely endorse them and that's why I keep buying them. The SRAM Eagle Axis Controller, very expensive, like, very, very expensive, but in my opinion, worth it. Yeah, you know, people say that uh, there's not a lot of weight savings and that's probably true, but I've noticed that it's incredibly reliable and super, super responsive and very sturdy as well. I, I really don't have any reason to say don't buy it aside from the price. Um, it's performed incredibly well for me and in the six months or so that I've had it, I think I've missed one shift. And I've got it on video. Whoa! Uh, yeah, that did not work. My first axis misshift. Exactly. Oh, all right. Sorry, guys. The setup for the shifter was pretty painless. Getting it on the bar was of course pretty easy, even with the one piece mount, and I had to get it all kind of dialed in and slid up and down and aligned to make it comfortable for my fingers. And of course, the ergonomics of the shifter is very different from other shifters that are out there. Up, down, or you can just rock back and forth with your thumb in there. Uh, I have no complaints about it, but it is different. And actually, uh, SRAM just recently announced that they've come out with a different shifting kit that you can put on top of this for more money, of course, that will make the shift levers, or for lack of a better term, shift levers, uh, work more like traditional Shimano or SRAM shifters. So they won't be this unique axis ergonomic design, which I think is a good thing, like make it more mainstream. Setting it up with the iPhone app, I found was very painless and worked well and was pretty quick. Other people have not had that experience. I know BKXC in his video was just talking about how it was kind of a pain in the butt. And uh, I'm not gonna tell, I'm not gonna say that he was wrong. Um, I have a feeling that it could be pretty difficult. Um, having grown up in Silicon Valley and having like grown up around devices that need to be configured, I didn't find it that challenging, but I certainly didn't enjoy it. Uh, it definitely could use a little bit of improvement in a couple of places, but overall, I found it pretty easy to do. Everything paired quickly. Everything worked the way I thought it was going to work. So I really don't have any complaints, although, you know, nothing's perfect. 
the SRAM code RSC brake. I consider it to be perfection, but maybe I'm a little bit biased. My old Bronson has the guide RSC and these things have also been just great. No complaints at all. They engage well. They have a nice engagement curve, so they don't just go full on as soon as you pull the brake back a little bit. You have, you have degrees of braking, so uh, they're very reliable and uh, they have a nice organic feel to them that I like a lot. But I'm not gonna lie to you guys and tell you that I know everything there is to know about the way the brakes work. All I know is that these are the next version after the guides is the codes, some sort of uh, next level kind of stuff. But uh, I guess that code is the next generation of advancement in technology after guide, I guess. I don't know. But uh, they sure do work well. 180 millimeter rotors got swapped out to 200s, or I guess they're 202s or 203s or something. Man, I don't know. I don't, I don't follow that stuff as much. But they're bigger rotors. I had to buy new little mounts for them, which is no big deal. But, you know, getting that stuff all set up took a little bit of time. But honestly, they engage really well. They're easy to maintain. It's easy to swap out the brake pads when I need to. And uh, they're pretty good. Now, metallic versus ceramic brakes, I don't know what the difference is. I don't know how important the difference really is. I ride in wet, I ride in dry. Um, you know, I do all sorts of climbing and descending and, and city riding and mountain riding, and I don't know what the difference is. All I know is I like my brakes. The SRAM X01 Axis derailleur is one of the best in its class. I guess you can get the higher end one that has a carbon uh, pulley cage, but I didn't do that because I don't see the reason. And it's, you know, I'm not getting paid by a sponsor to use this, so it makes no difference to me. I just want it to work well. And this works well. It works really well. It still has that wacky XG1 logo that I was talking about before, but I can live with that. Downsides, uh, the battery tends to go dead if you leave it on the bike while you're traveling long distances and you have the bike on a rack on the car because it jiggles around and that makes this thing actuate and it drains the battery. That's happened to me twice on my road trip, but I caught it early. Um, I usually take my bike off the car and check it the night before a ride. So I was able to catch the fact that the battery was dead and it didn't bother me the next day on the trail. So I was lucky about that. It goes in quick and it snaps in quick but it doesn't fall out. It's a good retention device. So, you know, no complaints there either. It's resilient. You can smack it around quite a bit and it doesn't take any punishment. It just pops right back to where it used to be. I've hit it on a few rocks on my rides and it's always popped back. An issue with this derailleur that I learned about while I was on my road trip is that the retention bolt can sometimes go loose. It works its way out of there a little bit over time if you're riding it really hard over an extended amount of time, or maybe even just on the back of the car, I really don't know. But uh, I was having some weird miss shifts and uh, uh, I brought it to a shop and I asked them to take a quick look at it. And they said, oh yeah, your retention bolt is loose. I would have never guessed to look at that because I figured I tightened it when I put it onto the torque spec and it would have been enough, but it wasn't. It uh, was loose. So they tightened it up and everything just worked immediately perfectly. So as long as I keep an eye on that, it shouldn't be a problem. So here's a test. I haven't touched this thing for a month and a half in probably 200 miles of riding. So let's see if it's loose. No, it's not. It's, it's pretty darn tight. I mean, I can, I can tighten it a little bit more, but I don't want to go past the torque spec. So, so far, so good. It looks like it's holding. I haven't had to adjust it yet on the fly, but if you wanted to stop on a trail, you could push that button down there and then put your hand on the shifter and shift it up and down. And uh, the rear derailleur will micro adjust very, very well. The seat post is a standard RockShox Reverb Axis. It works great. It's super reliable and uh, it really hasn't missed a throw ever. Uh, it's expensive as hell. It's really, it's like over $700. It's ridiculous how expensive it is and kind of dumb. That being said, it really is the best you can get. The control is easy to mount and easy to use, just like the Axis shifters. And uh, it syncs up using the same Axis app on my iPhone. And I can even swap the controls between the two and decide which of the buttons I want to shift and which of the buttons I want to 
use the seat post. And uh, it works really well. For the price, I wish it had things like variable height adjustment. I wish I could decide just how high it goes up, but uh, I can't do that. If I just tap the button, it goes up part way, but I can't really control it in a fine tuned sort of way. And it also comes up really fast and doesn't really hit me in the butt. So uh, it is there when I need it. The seat is a WTB Coda, no complaints there either. I usually would run the um, Silverado saddle and uh, I switched over to the Coda this time because it looked like it had a little bit more butt to it. But uh, honestly, I don't feel much of a difference. I know a lot of people say that there's a huge difference and that you really are supposed to use the Silverado because that's the better one, but I haven't noticed a difference. I think the Silverado looks a little cooler. I still have a Silverado on my Bronson and it's a little bit sleeker and a little bit thinner, but I don't feel much of a difference. So that's the bike build. It's a great build. I'm super happy with it. And uh, I don't really th feel like I need to change much. You know, I'm gonna swap out the forks maybe in the future and I'm definitely building the new wheels, but I don't really need to do either of those things. It's more like just playing around with a new toy. So the way it's set up now, I think anybody would be happy on a bike like that. It's thrilling and it's really the best mountain bike I've ever owned in my life. So, to me, the colors don't really matter that much. The frame, the DVO shock, the fork, the handlebars, the, I don't know what else has colors, the stickers on the rims, I mean, the cranks, things that have colors on them, I don't care if they match. It'd be nice if they did, they could look better, but really, I just want it to ride well, and it rides really well. I originally wanted the gray frame. It comes in gray and this bug zapper blue. And uh, I was really gonna want the, the gray because my original Bronson was black and I wanted to kind of keep that muted tone. But the bug zapper blue has grown on me, I've got to admit. It's, it's a really loud color and I kind of like it. A lot of people have had varying degrees of success with the SRAM app on the phone. I understand that it can be complicated, especially for people that aren't used to setting things like that up. That being said, I've been configuring things with iPhone apps for as long as there have been iPhones and even a little before that. And uh, I've never had a problem, you know, this it, it did everything the way I expected it to do things. So I didn't experience any issues. Everything paired and synced correctly. And I was able to very quickly kind of understand how the switches could be configured and how the adjustments could be made. So I didn't find it to be that difficult, and I'm not a particularly uh, engineer -y kind of uh, data-driven person. Uh, that being said, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, if, if my mom sat down and tried to set that thing up, she would have a hard time with it. I'm not super interested in learning the science and technology behind shock travel and rebound and, and spring and pressure and and all the stuff that shocks are so complicated. Oh God, it's crazy. So I want a front shock and a rear shock that I can set and keep a minimal eye on for things like air pressure and then just go out and ride and have fun. And I think that's what I have. So I'm really happy with the recipe there. Um, every once in a while, I'm more than happy to send them in and get them refitted and rebuilt because they do have to do that. Shocks need maintenance in order to work well. And I'm not the guy who's gonna be rebuilding his own shock, as much fun as it might be to learn that sort of thing and who knows what the future holds. But right now, I don't see myself learning that. I'm more than happy to put it in a box and be without my bike for a few weeks so that uh, when I get it back, it'll work even better than when I sent it in. So that's the build. It's my favorite bike. It may not be your favorite bike, but uh, I think everybody would enjoy riding it, assuming they can fit it. It's a large frame and, you know, compared to my old medium Bronson, it's pretty huge. But I'm super happy with the build on it. It rides like a dream, it climbs like a mountain goat, and everything about it is exactly what I wanted. So uh, I hope you enjoyed taking this little trip through my bike with me, and uh, if you have any questions, leave them below. I'm more than happy to answer them. And uh, go ahead and hit like and subscribe. Uh, I'm here for you next week. In the meantime, I'll see you out there on the trails.